Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, unlike in 2015, uh, where I first spoke at the Flo uh, Portland Float Conference, uh, this time uh, it is vir virtual. But what is the same is that I'm going to speak about chamber rest, which is completely different, or not completely, but quite a different topic from anybody else's uh, presentations, as I guess. Uh, everybody else is going to speak about floating or flotation rest. And I'm going to speak about quite a similar technique, but which is obviously not floating. So I hope uh, you will find it interesting for you, yourself. Um, the focus of my talk, or, or the focus uh, like in the floating is on darkness and solitude. But in floating is, is not um, as much about solitude because the procedure are quite short. In, in my research topic, the procedures are very, very long or can be very, very long. So that is why the solitude is the other focus. So why darkness and solitude matters? This is the talk. My name is Marek Mausch and I work uh, at, as the head of the Department of Psychology at the Faculty of Arts at the University of Ostrava in the Czech Republic. So welcome. The content. Uh, I asked for a workshop here, then I was asked to have also a lecture. So I decided to split it into uh, two sections, like uh, to the lecture, when I want to introduce you to some concepts uh, connected with chamber rest, with the history, then chamber rest, and then what we call the darkness therapy, uh, not only, but especially in the Czech Republic. And then in the questions and answers session or in the workshop, I hope uh, uh, we will be able to dive much deeper into this topic. And I could ask your questions, if you have any. And I'd like to, and I'd like to tell more about um, burnout effect, psychotherapy, and personal growth opportunities of chamber rest itself. So now the content of this talk is perceptual isolation, sensory deprivation, and then chamber uh, or restricted environmental stimulation. You know, flotation rest, I'll be talking about chamber rest. And then the, let's say, popular term darkness therapy. As for the introduction, uh, which I called research prehistory, uh, it is 1950s when perceptual isolation um, is uh, is emerging as a new field of experimental research of both uh, psychology and physiology. Uh, it is connected with McGill University in Quebec and the names like Donald O'Hepp and uh, John Peter Zubek, um, as you can see them in the uh, right down corner of the presentation. They had first laboratory for studying human reactions during stimulus modification. And in 1954, first published article. Uh, here you can see how it looked like. You, you can see the drawing of a perceptual isolation chamber from 1950s. Uh, you can see, I hope that, uh, that you can see the pointer of the mouse on the screen. You can you can see a um, communication device, a speaker and with microphone, some air ventilation and air conditioning or heating, for example, for controlling the temperature. Here you can see uh, the focus on the let's say guinea pig. You can see a participant in the study. You can see only lying down on his back, uh, some standardized standardized clothes, uh, bandages around his forearms. Then, uh, then you can see some wires, probably from e ECG measure, and you can see goggles over his eyes. What is important in, in, this, in this era, the focus, the emphasis wasn't only on darkness and silence, but also on different levels of light and sound. Let's uh, let's say gray sound and gray light. Uh, sometimes it was all uh, it was also about excessive stimulation. So not only let's say sensory deprivation, the new, new the newer terminology, not only about monotonous stimulation, but also excessive stimulation or overstimulation. So, uh, for example, all the time he was under mm, light. You couldn't see any patterns or colors, but some vague light, or you could hear only a vague sound all the time. 
hospital. The first results. Effects mostly described as unpleasant and distracting. Visual and hearing hallucinations, disturbance of perception and cognition, mood swings, disorientation, increased suggestibility, increased stress and anxiety, and most participants abort their stays prematurely. If I ask you why, if, I, if I'd ask you why, I think you could answer yourself. Uh, imagine you are this participant, you are this guinea pig. How long would you survive these conditions? Well, it um, so it was, uh, I, I call it a prehistoric milestone. There, were, there was methodological anarchy. Uh, they used different equipment, terminology, definitions, methods. Overstimulation, which I already mentioned, and monotonous stimulation was, were often mistaken for, uh, which we called later sensory deprivation. And also there was a te theoretical unclarity. So this era stopped and era of sensory deprivation began. Uh, this era too, I called informed prehistory, not uh, not the first, not like the first one. This was better because it was more rigorous. The research uh, was more rigorous. It is 1960s and 70s, and there are there were over 20 laboratories in the United States, Canada, Japan, and Germany, and emphasis was put on darkness and silence. Basic research oriented on questions of human need for stimulation, excitation, nature, and its relation to environmental stimulation, cognitive effects of isolation. Proven effects on uh, psychological functioning uh, were thinking, perception, memory, motivation, and mood. So quite a broad range of effects on a human psychology and physiology too. And first hypothesis of uh, possible therapeutical effects appeared. But still it was something like what I call a uh, blind alley of prehistory. But why was it a blind alley? because sensory deprivation was wrongfully connected with brainwashing and contactless torture. Uh, it was the era of Cold War and the researchers and their families were harassed, by, uh, harassed and attacked both physically and mentally by militant students. And also tragic death of John Peter Zubek, the leading figure of that era, went to end of usage, the term sensory deprivation, because uh, it uh, it got a very bad reputation those days. Here you can see a sensory deprivation chamber at the University of British Columbia. Again, I hope you, you can see the mouse uh, track. Uh, uh, on the left side, there's a bed. Now it's more comfortable. If you can see the, the prior picture, this is more comfortable because you don't have only the bed in the very small room. You have also a dry toilet and a fridge for keeping some beverages and, and meals cold to make it last longer. You have also a chair with a desk for completing some cognitive tasks or personality uh, tasks after com just after completing the stay uh, under these conditions well and this is um, this is to to clarify why sensory deprivation and the research of sensory deprivation uh, was connected with contactless torture uh, and uh, as you can see in this picture, which is from 2004, a hooded Iraqi detainee at the Abu Ghraib prison appears to be cuffed uh, at the ankle and chained to a door handle while being made to balance on two boxes. Uh, this is why it was, um, uh, it was connected, sensory deprivation and contactless torture. But if you think about it, probably you will find that sensory deprivation is not what is what is the main problem in this picture but the main problem is that really this is a prison who is tortured uh, in a specific way and what we can call sensory deprivation that he has a bag over his head uh, it's is only for only for emphasizing the the bad um, the bad situation he's in but this is not about sensory deprivation. 
it, it's used for strengthening the negative effects of the situation. But, you know, it's it's like with everything in the life, you can use the advantages or disadvantages or everything. You, you can use almost everything to good, bad, uh, to good, uh, to do good or evil things. We can move on, move on then to 1970s and 1980s. And this is the era of new terminology, restricted or reduced environmental stimulation, followed by the word technique or therapy. It depends, it depends, it depended on, on the focus of the research. Uh, so the terminology moved from sensory deprivation and uh, from now on we will use more the, the abbreviation REST, which stands for the title of the screen. Uh, just a funny note, and maybe not a funny note, uh, John Lilly, he suggested that this abbreviation could stand for Restore Energy Safely Traveling. And I can imagine that many of you, especially of you floaters, would agree with this terminology and maybe you would like it. But uh, we will stick to the academic form of the terminology. So restricted or reduced environmental stimulation technique or therapy. Two major branches. Uh, let's forget about immersion rest. It's, it's more complicated and uh, as far as I know, it, it's not researched anymore. We have chamber rest and flotation rest. Uh, one more sentence I will say about flotation rest, and then I mm, I will let others to speak about floating all the time. Uh, flotation rest was recognized that it is effective for changes in autonomic nervous system and stress response changes. Unlike chamber rest. Uh, which was recognized for changes in central nervous system and behavioral or habitual changes. So more deliberate, more conscious changes. An increasing attention uh, towards improving memory, perceptual motor coordination and creativity. So now, from now on, we will talk only about chamber rest and I'll deliver you the summary of find findings from the researchers and authors like Sutfeld, Barabash, Bori, and others. Here you can see the rest chamber at the University of British Columbia, and it is a Peter Sutfeld's uh, laboratory, or it was, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, not, not only the picture is colored, but uh, you can see again, bed, this, this is totally important when you spend not only several hours, but sometimes day or several days in this, env in this environment, so you need to have a bed, then some comfortable armchair, and again, uh, an intercom, some communication device for communicating with the operator, the observer, the researcher. Here, because Peter Sutfeld is the most, uh, he's, the, he's not the only one, but he's the most important person for the REST terminology, REST research, and also for me personally, because it was Peter who invited me uh, to the Portland Float Conference 2015. So this is why I'm uh, mentioning him and uh, thanking to him also. Uh, now, the four major areas which were recognized that uh, chamber rest has impact on them. It's really relief from stimulus overload, increasing stimulus hunger, memory improvement, and increasing cognition and behavioral flexibility. So these four areas, we are going to talk a little more. Uh, the first one, stimulus overload. The essence of chamber rest is drastic restriction of environmental stimulation and information. And application of this principle could be, for example, neonatal intensive care unit for prematurely born children. Uh, it's not for uh, psychology experimental research but it's it's actually the application because this uh, this NICU unit th this unit uh, uses uh, the um, sorry I, I, I can't remember the word it's using actually some mild form of chamber rest of this uh, reduced environmental stimulation uh, where, where you can uh, uh, observe reduction of cry, muscular dysfunction, and other bodily symptoms. 
and also for uh, isolation or exclusion of distracting inappropriate, inappropriate and violent individuals because the solitude and low stimulation brings stress overload relief. Uh, also autistic children, uh, this did, uh, now I'm describing specific experiments during 1970s and 1980s, all, all these re results, all these findings. Uh, don't, don't, Im uh, don't imagine that they put autistic children under complete rest conditions like, the, like complete darkness and solitude. They didn't want to torture them at all, but they put them into a mild, moderate form of rest, which meant uh, solitude and less light not darkness, only less light and more silent uh, environment. And they uh, they mm, put also a control group or control group where autistic children on normal pediatric unit. And the experimental group in the moderate rest conditions showed improvement on various levels like social interaction and autistic behavior and without observed signs of stress which is important, otherwise it would be a torture for them uh, if we could observe a stress. Then, for example, we had children, so now elder people or very, very, very old people, uh, specifically patients with dementia of Alzheimer type. Uh, now it was in a form of instructions for staff and visitors to reduce excessive stimulation, stimulus in the institution. Probably this... Uh, uh, the stimuli in the institution wasn't excessive for uh, people in normal age, like, like me and you, but for the old people, it became to be excessive. So there were instructions and it led to, uh, in, to in the disoriented patients, uh, as you can see, 81 to 94 years old, that they showed significant improvement in ability to cope with everyday activities. And uh, they showed decrease of restlessness, weight gain, trending towards mental and emotional characteristics improvement. When the staff and visitors were following these instructions to lower the stimuli in the institution, then point number two, stimulus hunger. Uh, the natural consequence of staying in rest 24 hours and more leads to intensive, intensive reaction to stimulus. Just, uh, just imagine it as you know it. We, now we are talking about mental stimulus hunger, but maybe, maybe all of you, definitely me, I, I, I know what is a normal hunger uh, when I'm too long on a diet, for example, at least three hours for me, three hours, it's it's quite a long diet for me. It happens that when I'm exposed to some food, this is my stomach. This is my stomach and inner child, which is enjoying and, and totally looking forward for the food. And how can we use it? We, we can use it actually in a very similar way uh, to our mind, because the principle is actually maybe, maybe or, or it's very similar. Uh, for example, for phobias and in um, uh, and with some addition for weight reduction, for phobias, for example, fear of snakes, one experiment, five hours of chamber rest conditions, complete darkness, solitude, silence. I, I sometimes omit, uh, I don't, don't mention the word silence, but silence is also uh, very important mm, for the reduction of stimuli. Five, hour, five hours of chamber rest and subsequent visual exposition, picture presentation, followed by exposition in vivo, in, in, a real, in reality. Uh, when control group showed no effect, the experimental group with five hours of chamber rest and then sub subsequent visual exposition of snakes, which they wouldn't prefer normally to, to watch snakes on pictures. Why would they do that if they if they hate it, if they, if they fear of it? But after five hours of mental diet, of stimuli diet, they quite liked actually the pictures of the snakes. And then in, ex in a real exposition, they were there. They were able to approach real life snakes much closer 
than before the experiment. So this was the improvement, the ability to get much more closer to the feared stimuli, which was uh, which were snakes. And weight reduction, it's a little bit complicated, not much, but a little bit. Uh, it's connected with concepts like overboredom, overlearning, and aversive function. And it was used for a reduction of problematic favorite food consumption and fat loss. When your favorite food is uh, some greens, grass, and vegetables, it's not a problem. But when your favorite food is something like McDonald's uh, and, and other uh, junk food and greasy food, uh, when you try to overeat it in, in your normal life, you probably don't want to eat it for some period of time. But when you are exposed to chamberest conditions and your hunger becomes much more obvious, uh, much stronger, and you become, let's say, overboard, then when you put much of some specific stimuli like this food that you it make it that it make you sick then you overlearn of this stimulus and then the aversive function then do you don't want to see it and eat it again is much more persistent and they uh, they showed uh, uh, and uh, the participants showed fat loss after it now point number three memory improvement one experiment, just uh, just very briefly, 24 hours of chamber rest, verbal and non-verbal non methods, and in both methods, the participant showed showed improvement, like improvement in memory after 24 hours of rest. I made an experiment with uh, 48 hours, then uh, with three days and four day long stays. And I can say that it's different. It seems that when you spend 24 hours in chamber rest, uh, your brain is really relaxed and prepared for uh, for the challenges. But after two days, three days, four days, it becomes become be, becomes also a little bit lazy, and uh, you need some time to adjust to the mm, to the normal world. World. So after two, three, and four days basically you don't see an improvement but after one day if they it showed like that and experiment number two uh, is connected with electro -con electroconvulsive therapy so the um, electroconvulsive therapy for depressive patients with subjective memory loss after the electroconvulsive therapy uh, one note to it this is about an experiment three maybe four decades ago uh, nowadays, the electroconvulsive therapy is still being used for very hard mm, mm, pharmacoresistant depressions and and so, some other um, problems. And uh, but today it's much more modern and is much more gentle than it used to be. So I'm not talking about uh, uh, contemporary research, but research back in 80s and 70s, and uh, those days, uh, the patients uh, had quite traumatic impression from electroconvulsive therapy. And when, after electroconvulsive therapy, uh, they were put uh, under moderate rest conditions, something like the autistic children, they showed less traumatic impression from electroconvulsive therapy even though it was no not supported in objective uh, tests but the subjective experience was less traumatic which is also important well now and the second the fourth area which i think is actually the most important but it's not the only one important because the all areas uh, they they work together but uh, as, as itself, this is the most important one, cognitive and behavioral flexibility. Many chamber rest studies are based on discoveries that the rest environment reduces thinking and behavioral pattern rigidity. Uh, by measuring reactions related to attitude and problem solving, we can say that. Um, it was found that influencing thinking flexibility happens uh, 
even without new information exp exposure because you can add some you can put some information into the darkness and silence for example you can you can tell some information to the people which could uh, change their attitude you can give them some new information for example that greasy food uh, junk food is not healthy for you that smoking is not healthy for you and that you can have some more benefit health beneficial habits but also without exposure ex exposing to any new information uh, the thinking flexibility is influenced and what is the most important you can per, uh, see also behavioral change in the people uh, and specifically a nicotine habit breaking by unfreezing rigid structures of thinking emotions motivation and behavior supporting the habit of course it has to be in compliance to clients wish to change or abandon the habit but it's like any other kind of therapy psychotherapy you need to the client to be compliant with it sometimes it was in combination with audio records related to the habit as i uh, briefly mentioned uh, a few seconds ago a few seconds ago and the most effective combination is of various interventions like self-management training, hypnosis, uh, supporting groups and consulting and with the rest procedure. And low level of relapses is, and specifically low level of relapses, is while combining rest procedure uh, with other interventions. And also some side effects were found. Uh, normally we don't want side effects where we take some medicine drugs pills we don't want these side effects like nausea death and, and you know um, very very broad variety of negative symptoms but side effects during chamber rest are quite different normally you seek for a diff uh, required result it could be reduction or elimination a problem or a problematic behavior of the client but what was not expected it was found that time in the course of procedure is spontaneously spent by deeper reflecting on self life issues and solution which was found which is found is often successfully applied later increased frequency of health beneficial behavior like more exercise and less greasy food uh, solution of interpers interpersonal issues in family and work is often find, found muscular tension hypertension neck pain anxieties uh, uh, tends to get better and this applies mainly for flotation rest because it's mostly connected with autonomic nervous system and stress response changes then some changes in life view and um, again some specific effects sleeping without medication more adaptive reaction to partners a death and increase assertiveness etc and all of these weren't expected the assumption is that mood improvement uh, improvement of, of self-efficacy self-confidence and optimism can ease up desired changes but also uh, some disturbing and negative thoughts feelings and memories may appear during the course course of the procedure so like some risk mm, of it potential risk well so the results seemed to be quite promising but still uh, the chamber as research very similar to flotation rest research disappeared for decades but now flotation rest research is flourishing uh, it has been flourishing for the past decade or two especially in the united states and canada and chamber rest is much more slower in it because there were and there are some application obstructions the first was aversion to the rest because still it was mistaken uh, for prior sensory deprivation researches which were connected to contactless torture and brainwashing then uh, there were issues related to the procedure and it's still uh, you know how is it to operate a flo flotation rest a floating tank and uh, for the chamber rest is 
maybe even more complicated because you need the speci special facility. We will, we, I will show you pictures afterwards. And in the facility, you can have one, one, one man at a time. And also problems related to the client because not every client wishes to spend one day, two days, maybe seven days under complete darkness, silence and solitude. This is definitely not for everyone. The same as floating is not for everyone, but still floating is uh, much more accessible to more people. I would say that the chain breast procedure. The conclusion is many clinical applications are based on solid experimental data. Meta-analytical meta meta study conducted by Kendall has shown in chamber rest studies mild effect. Uh, the effect size was uh, 0.45 for the chamber rest itself. It was slightly bigger, 0.51 in combination with other procedure and a lower rate of relapses and only 0.25 uh, in a non-rest procedures. And I think and I believe that replications in present time and conditions are required. If you ask me why I think so, I think so because uh, the time is completely different now and the conditions are completely different. The motivation of the clients is completely different and etc. etc. So now I will show you the last part of this presentation and it's today's design and terminology what is ac academically known as chamber rest is in the popular terminology and about about common people known as darkness therapy it is what i used mostly and uh, also with the abbreviation dt then sometimes darkness retreats more more connected with some spiritual retreats meditation etc also, the word dunkel therapy, a German word from Holger Kalweit, who is actually the, let's say, the, the father of the Western uh, chain um, darkness therapy, uh, as we know it uh, for, for some decades. And please don't confuse it with dark therapy. In 2015, in my own talk, I used the term dark therapy, but actually it, it existed before, and it's a terminology from James Phelps. And it's connected with use, using goggles for blocking blue light wavelength uh, and using it experimentally for treating bipolar uh, disorders patients. So it's, it's different. It's connected with only virtual darkness when you still can see. But for example, during uh, 6 p.m. till 6 a.m. the next day, the, the blue light spectrum is blocked and doesn't reach your eyes, but it's completely different than the chamber chamber rest. So not dark therapy, but darkness therapy. The facility uh, in which you can undergo the procedure, uh, I will show you two types of facilities in the Czech Republic. This is, let's say, type one, which is a bigger and more comfortable one, and also one under medical background. Uh, this one specifically in Beskidi Rehabilitation Center, Chaladna. Uh, so you, you can see it uh, uh, from outside. Now you can see uh, the inside. Uh, wh when you enter it, there are two separate entrance door to, to make maximum uh, to, to, um, uh, blockade for, for the visual and the hearing stimuli. Then you have uh, the antechamber where your food is delivered and also where you can find enough uh, enough drinking water what you what you need for survive, surviving in there because you you have you have a food delivery and beverage delivery on daily basis and you don't suffer from this kind of diet unlike you want it of course you can be also an, on, on on this diet too if you want uh, then you can see a shower room uh, and here you can see the air condition uh, air recuperation unit, which serves the whole facility with fresh air. It it takes out the old air and uh, it puts in uh, it um, and it brings you the fresh air. Here you can see the main room, the main living room, with a bed, comfortable armchair, some uh, exercise devices. 
this is under complete darkness this is uh, what is uh, as i as i mentioned uh, your stay could be for example seven days actually seven days one week long stay every single minute under complete darkness and outer silence still you can make your own noises sure uh, and solitude but the solitude is interrupted once a day unlike you wishes it a different way so normally once a day your guide therapist comes inside and uh, and talk to you talk to you uh, what are your needs how are you dealing how are you coping with uh, the environment and he could also uh, um, be your therapist he could you could discuss uh, specifically this, this man in basket rehabilitation Chavadna. he's a psychologist so he's having psychologists uh, psychology sessions with you under complete darkness and under complete darkness this light is only for the photography purposes but everything is uh, mm, is happening at the same conditions all the time only once a day for five minutes 30 minutes 45 minutes it depends you have uh, the visit of the therapist so another photo of it and this is uh, the floor plan and i will discuss the floor plan uh, uh, more in depth in uh, in the workshop section and some illustrative photography of how you can spend the time in the course of procedure and this is dr andrew urbish the psychologist from this uh, um, um, this center as i mentioned before and now the second type of darkness therapy or rest chamber in the Czech Republic which is the most common one types like this uh, we have around 20 or we have around 20 providers in the Czech Republic with um, uh, rest chambers like this and some of them has only one some of them has two chambers some of them has up to four chambers so I guess it for uh, around 50 apartments for chamber rest stays in the Czech Republic. So here, this you can see it's uh, it's quite a nice nature in Beskidi Mountains, wooden head, wooden cottage, uh, uh, at the operator's place at his garden. Uh, and now I'm I'm showing you two separate facilities, two two separate apartments. Uh, and on the left side you can see the antechamber of one and on on the right side you can see the antechamber of the second one and as you can see what is normal is to have a toilet then to have a sink and uh, a shower and sometimes you have a bidet because it could be the hygiene could be easier while using a bidet during the chamber rest uh, here you can see again some armchair on the left side is a uh, is a bed and uh, you can see a CD mp3 player here for my studies I forbid to use mpc players it's not available uh, in the in the in the type one uh, the the bigger rehabilitation center Chaladna and its facility it's also forbidden but but for uh, many operators of uh, chamber rest or the darkness therapy providers they mm, their attitude is you pay for the procedure and if you want to listen to some music or to some audiobooks it is up to you now again uh, an armchair and some exercise facility now the bed the bed again some fresh fruits um, delivered on daily basis as I mentioned and this is how it looks like uh, during winter quite nice isn't it well and all of this was approved by Peter Sutfeld and his wife Phyllis uh, when we visited in 2014 uh, Dr. Andrew Urbish place in Chaladna and just four kilometers from that place this one in Kozlovice uh, at the provider Roman Bartak now could be a place for your questions and my answers but I think it, it won't work uh, right now and it will be uh, but we will be able to discuss uh, the, all this topic more in depth in following workshop section. So thank you for your attention.